today, death by suicide, the seventh leading cause of death in Jefferson County, a rate higher than the national average. Children at the nexus of the problem, with death among youngsters ages 10 to 24 up a staggering 56%. A group of high school students detail the problem. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Conversation. Today, the alarming growth and severity of an issue that ripples through generations, devastating children and grandchildren, parents and grandparents, touching all ages, all races, all ethnicities and genders, a growing problem here in Jefferson County, disproportionately impacting our young people. We spoke with a group of high school kids about death by suicide. Four Lakewood High School teens who told us they don't have a lot of conversations about death by suicide with their parents. The comfort with it, because a lot of times our comfort discussing it doesn't match theirs, and that can create a lot of problems. Youth are scared or nervous to talk to their parents for fear of judgment or blaming or even that they'll get in trouble somehow. But they do talk about it more with each other, especially with friends who are close. I would say that I have discussions very easily with my friends, and I think my, pe my female peers um, do the same. The only friends that I've ever talked to about this subject are the ones that I'm incredibly close with. And a key point, it is hard to know, they say, even for them, who is at risk and who is not. People in my generation tend to use humor as a coping mechanism, and like thus, they tend to joke around and say, I'm going to kill myself, or I didn't turn in my homework, I'm going to kill myself. And it could be a joke, but they might not be being serious other times, and sometimes they could mean it. I really do believe people start to reach out before they want to do something. It's just a matter of being aware of that. And then, even if they do recognize that someone might be having a problem, it's hard to know how to help. Even if you do recognize those things and they are asking for help, I think a lot of times people are really unsure about what to do. They have to keep in mind that it's not going to be just one simple fix to, to whatever's going on. Four very different young people who all seem to share similar opinions about dealing with death by suicide. Show of hands, how many of you think suicide prevention is something your peers care about? All. Show of hands, how many of you think we need to concentrate more on supporting people who have fallen off the competitive ladder who go to these dark places. How many of you think we need to find more ways to support them? Show of hands. All of How many of you think adults have a lack of understanding about the pressures you undergo in high school? All of you. How many of you appreciate the opportunity to talk about this today? Because talking about it is often the only way to discover it. Even you, as close as you are to your peer groups, would you agree that it's just a very difficult, subtle thing, a very difficult thing to pick out? Really? Hands up. All agree. Thank you all for your time today. So the kids are saying, and we found this to be pretty universal, that parents just don't understand how tough high school is, and they do want to talk about suicide. I would like to begin our discussion today with our expert panel. Please welcome Pamela Gould, Communities That Care Coordinator at Jefferson County Public Health, Heather Trish, Director of Culturally Relevant and Trauma-Informed Services at Jefferson County, and Michelle Gonzalez, Suicide Prevention Coordinator at Jeffco Public Schools. Welcome to all of you. I so appreciate your being here today. I want to start with some brand new numbers from the CDC that just came out last week that are very alarming. CDC says, Centers for Disease Control says, there have been, in 2018, there were a million and a half suicides, the most since World War II, that in fact there were more suicides in our country than there were homicides. That takes your breath away. I'm wondering if any of you can tell me what's behind, the, or, or all of you, can tell me what's behind those numbers. I think that it's important to recognize that there's no one single issue going on here. There are many issues contributing to the, the, the rate of suicide, the high numbers of suicide that we see in this country, and especially in our state, and in Jefferson County in particular. Um, a lot of different issues. Um, we're here today to talk about um, the connection to kids and the focus on youth in particular, but there are a lot of different kind of age brackets and demographics that are at higher risk for suicide. Right. In fact, there's this headline right now in the Denver Post about uh, their uh, public safety department, how they lost uh, seven employees in the last two years. So it, it's one of those things that seems to touch 
all parts of our society, law enforcement, uh, business, of course, uh, uh, students and professionals. I mean, there really seems to be no boundaries to it at all. That's your impression, too. I, that's why whenever I talk about this as a journalist or a broadcaster, what I get from parents is, you know what? You talk about this all the time, and you roll all these numbers at us, but you really don't give us any solution. So today, we actually have a solution. We have something for parents that I think is very important. This is called 12 Talks to Have with Teens. So the 12 Talks is online. Uh, it is uh, for teens who don't have a parent or guardian to talk with. Uh, and for and just for parents generally of teens as well. And uh, what we've learned is that if they if kids get to talk with a responsible adult, uh, they are 3.5 times more likely uh, to be uh, not to be depressed, and two to three times more likely uh, to uh, abate or stop using drugs. Parents seem to be and and responsible adults seem to be a key component in this equation. I think that's right, Mark. Um, one of the, we've talked through communities that care with over 200 youth in Jefferson County, and we've heard over and over and over again that they actually really do need to talk to adults about a variety of topics. They want to talk to adults, but they tell us over and over that certain topics seem to be either taboo or that adults feel really uncomfortable talking about them. So with 12 Talks to Have with Teens, we tried to put together, using a lot of community partners, we had experts from across the community, put together ideas for how to start those conversations, um, ideas for open-ended questions that will get teens really talking, and some basic facts that can help them frame the conversation. It covers a lot of ground, so we, we talk about hopefulness and coping and the mental health piece, which are two, two key pieces. Mm -hmm. Vaping and tobacco, identity, dating, alcohol, sex, I mean, all the things that kids uh, want to talk about. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, the, the kids uh, told us very directly in our conversation uh, with them uh, this last week that th these are all topics that they're, that they're interested in, that they want help with, and that they want direction from parents for. Sure. Yeah, really. Uh, I, I was really surprised. I thought maybe they'd be, there'd be a lot more of this than there was. But in fact, you're saying it's really any responsible adult. It doesn't necessarily have to be a parent. There's so many opportunities for kids to connect with responsible adults in their lives, whether that be a parent, a guardian, a coach, a teacher, a therapist, a social worker, a doctor. Um, there, there are just so many options, and so I think it's important to kind of broaden the framework of it's not just parents. We are a community that wants to support our kids. There's this other great piece, uh, a video on the website, you know, that the internet can be just just a, a horrible place for kids to be, but can also be a blessing in many ways. And this is another p a piece of tape that you referred me to, the mysterious workings of the teenage brain. Uh, everybody thinks they know how their uh, children's brains are working, but you know, uh, perhaps not. So I wanted to show a clip of this. It will enlighten you as to how teens listen to you and adjust to your way of thinking. So we, we sometimes um, laugh about teenagers. We, they're parodied, sometimes even demonized in the media for their kind of typical teenage behavior. They take risks, they're sometimes moody, they're very self-conscious. I have a really nice anecdote from a friend of mine who said that the thing he noticed most about his teenage daughters before and after puberty was their level of embarrassment in front of him. So he said, before puberty, if my two daughters were messing around in a shop, I'd say, hey, stop messing around and I'll sing your favorite song. And instantly they'd stop messing around and he'd sing their favorite song. After puberty, that became the threat. <laughs> The very notion of their dad singing in public was enough to make them behave. Sarah Jane Blakemore, a professor of neuroscience, and essentially what she is saying there, that kids really are wired a lot differently than we are, and that we need, as parents, to take a moment and recognize that. Yes, I agree with that. And I also think that um, one of the things that we really look at with communities that care is that it's hard sometimes to be a parent of teenagers. It's hard to be a trustable adult. But it's also something that you, as a parent, are the expert in your own teen. And I think when you have teenagers, they don't necessarily come to you and explain that you're the expert in them, but you're the person as their parent or guardian or adult that they live with, you're the person that loves them the most. You're the person that knows them best. 
and you're the person that understands their family history and their background. So I do think it's so key to make sure that as a community we're not only supporting teenagers, but we're supporting the adults that they lean on to make sure that they can do the best job they can do right. in communicating with teens as teens go through these ups and downs right. that are really normal in so teenage. That's a big question. So one key here is trying to recognize, how do you separate all the usual teenage drama and emotion uh, from a youngster who is really struggling. I get this parent, this question from parents all the time. How do I know? Because my kid on the outside looks great and grades are pretty good and social interactions are, are pretty good. There's some teenage drama, but how do you know if a kid is struggling? Are there, is there something that you guys can put your finger on for us today? So many things. Do you want to yeah. start with that? I, yeah, and I'd, I guess I'd start by saying, too, oftentimes we think um, we need to have the talk, mm -hmm. right, with our kids. And if we're having the talk, then um, what we're doing is creating an uncomfortable situation. So really we need to think about this um, more as a series of ongoing conversations that we're having with our teens or with our children. So um, like Pamela said, being able to be the one to know, you know, how do they tick? Are they usually in their room? Are they usually um, interacting and involved? What's their typical behavior? Because we want to be watching for behavior changes. We also, um, oftentimes as parents, what we think of as just those sort of everyday teenage, high school, middle school life things may or may not be for our own child. So if we have a child who's already struggling with depression or isolation or not feeling like they have um, support or that they belong somewhere, um, and then that child experiences what might seem like an everyday thing, disappointing a teacher, getting a bad grade on a test, getting into an argument with their friends, um, getting in trouble with their parents, those might not be just regular everyday things. Those might be things that we really do need to pay attention to. Uh, some other obvious warning signs, if you will, might be things like giving away prized possessions, um, uh, noticing uh, an increase in their irritability or aggression. Uh, irritability is probably the number one symptom really? for adolescents in terms of depression. But again, parents say, you know, my, my son or daughter, <laughs> they're always irritated. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, they always seem to be feeling a, a lot of self-pressure. Uh, they perceive everything differently, you know, small events uh, that, well, things that appear to yeah. us to be small are not small to them. So is that a hard thing to, to pick out or do you think most parents know when their kids are extra irritable? Uh, you know, I, being transparent, I think it's a hard thing. I think it's a hard thing to decipher um, as a mental health professional and as a parent. And so again, I think it goes back to, this is a constant dialogue we have across the dinner table or sitting in their bedroom before bed at night or, or while we're taking a walk or driving in the car, you know, whatever it might be. Um, we aren't necessarily, I mean, if we're trying to look for that needle in the haystack, that's really difficult. Right. So you need to, this needs to be an ongoing yeah. conversation and not just the talk. Do you think kids who are struggling, are they more likely to talk to a parent or a responsible adult if they are struggling or less likely? Do you think they start to isolate themselves? Is that a, maybe, I mean, I'm just guessing here. Is that another sign? Well, we have some data on that in Jefferson County, actually. The youth were asked that as part of the 2017 Healthy Kids Colorado Survey. In Jefferson County, um, about a third of youth said that they would go first to a friend. But one-fifth said that they would go to a parent or another adult that lives with them or another family member that's an adult. Um, and a much smaller percentage, about 2% said they had someone at school, and about 2% said they had someone, another adult in the community oh, that really? they could go to. Mm. So while a lot of youth do go to friends, a lot of them also report that the first person they would go to is an adult that they live with. I'll be darned. So we talk, friends are so important. Mm -hmm. uh, I've forgotten how important friends are in high school, but they, all these kids uh, and, and other youngsters that we talked to all identified uh, one or two and sometimes uh, particularly if it was the the, uh, the girls in the group, they had four or five very close friends that kind of hang together like clusters of grapes, you know, and they rely and, re and lean on those people. But uh, we also talked to those kids. Well, we asked them, would you go to a friend first or would you go to a parent first? And we've, we've, we got answers on both sides. But the one thing that came up with all these kids was the subject of mandatory reporting. And uh, I want you to listen to their concern and, uh, and then uh, find out uh, what we need to know about how that works. Here's what the kids had to say about mandatory reporting. Another key point, there may not be enough support. At the moment, there's really not, well, 
is there enough support for people who, who you may think are struggling? Are there enough resources? Uh, no, absolutely not. Show of hands, how many believe there's enough support? No. Yeah, I believe that the resources do exist, but a lot of them, either teens are very worried about mandatory reporting or they don't know about the resources at all, so help never gets to them. Kids don't want to typically bring that drama into their lives, so they tend to steer clear of some resources. We need another avenue, don't we? Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, we do. Mandatory reporting, something all the kids wanted to talk about, something they all worry about. What is mandatory reporting? Mandatory reporting, in a nutshell, is essentially a legal obligation by certain professionals uh, that they must report child abuse or neglect. I think there's a, maybe a mis misperception here that it is about suicide, um, or that if you hear that somebody is thinking of suicide, that they call 911. And in the world of mental health, that's in fact not the case. There's a whole continuum of suicidality. Um, and, and we want to make sure folks are safe. So if they're talking about thoughts and they're engaged with a mental health professional, we are, we are targeting uh, either those symptoms or directly the suicidality that that person is experiencing. Um, then they might have a plan, they might have intent to carry that plan out. Um, depending on where they fall on that continuum, uh, we are asking for uh, support uh, when that gets to be, uh, we can't keep this person safe or they cannot keep them selves safe, right. um, uh, but, but talking about suicide does not mean that we are calling 911 and that law enforcement are showing up to intervene. It's simply not the case. Right. Uh, we would rather have uh, mental health professionals uh, intervening uh, to support that person through that mental health crisis. That's interesting. The kids will say they want to talk to you, mm -hmm. but they're afraid to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So are you champions of mandatory reporting? Do you support it? Is, is it it's needed and necessary? It's absolutely necessary. And, and like I said, it's a legal obligation that many professions in the state of Colorado are required uh, uh -huh. to carry out. Right. So the kids say, we really need another avenue. Right. Is there another avenue for them besides? So, so just to clarify, uh, there is not a mandatory reporting on suicide. Um, this is about child abuse and neglect. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so they don't know. They don't seem to know that. No. Well, uh, there is a there is another oh, piece. There's a codicil, yeah, there's so. another piece. I, we've heard throughout our town halls and our youth focus groups that mandatory reporting um, often occurs when a youth has been sexually assaulted, including by another youth. Which I think everyone everyone understands mm -hmm. how important that is. And and so what and so they we've heard a lot of stories from youth where there was some sort of assault or suspected assault, and mandatory reporting ends up in a cascade of issues for the victim him or herself. And so I do think in that particular instance when we're hearing from people who are trying to help that the system is getting in the way, mm -hmm. that that's a place that we could look at making some changes. And the connection really to this is that we know that youth who have been sexually assaulted are at many times higher risk of suicidal ideation. Right. Maybe we need a big sign that says no mandatory reporting if you have a friend. <laughs> I mean, I don't, that's a hard message to get across to kids because it seems universally they are, they are very, uh, well, so we asked the kids, would you, would you report a friend or would you go to an adult for a friend that you thought was struggling? And they were really hesitant to say yes. Which is scary. Yes. Because yeah. they're the first to know, right? Typically. Right. Typically. 70% Often. of the time is what mm -hmm. studies show. Their friends are the first to know. Yeah. Which, teaches me that we need to do a better job of educating them that accessing help is not punitive it it's it's for help and support right and i think mandatory reporting sometimes is shorthand for they get into the system and feel like things get out of control and i'm not sure it's always specifically taught when they talk about mandatory reporting my perception of some of the youth talking about that is that that's sort of shorthand now for many things happening not just the sort of legal reporting that happens. Right, yep. right. Very, very uh, difficult topic mm -hmm. for the kids. I, I'm wondering, so I, I know as a journalist, as a broadcaster, when we cover death by suicide, usually the family of the victim is astonished that it happened. I, I did not, I was, I'm so surprised by this. I did not see this coming. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if, if that's, uh, if that's a, a normal reaction from parents, or so you do, you see that all the time, you as well, when when these things happen. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, I um, I've seen this 
for decades um, as I support families uh, post-suicide. Um, and what we do know is that about 70% of uh, folks who die by suicide so showed some sort of symptoms, right, or some sort of uh, sharing of this information with an individual uh, in some way. And I don't share that to say that people should should know and be able to prevent this, but but I share that in in saying that we can all do a better job of learning what those signs are and those changes in behavior are and paying attention and having those conversations. We can definitely do a better job of connecting and seeing signs of suicide before they happen. But yes, sometimes uh, there there are no apparent signs that, that are, are present. Uh, right. But regardless, if they are or are not present, um, those families, those loved ones after a suicide are devastated. Absolutely devastated. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing when you encounter these children and you get a chance to talk to them, what's the first thing you say to them? Someone who's who you're pretty sure is uh, gone to a very dark place and you, you need to bring them back to a good reality. What's the first thing you say to them? Uh, well, if they're, if they're exhibiting signs of suicide, if they're thinking about suicide, uh, you really need to ask directly. You know, um, if you're having a conversation and you're seeing a lot of uh, signs for suicide, you say, you know, sometimes when people are struggling in the way that you seem to be struggling, uh, they think about ending their lives. They think about suicide, and I'm wondering if you are thinking of that as well. Right. And you need to ask directly. That's very important. Well, these kids say they tell us, you know, nobody really knows how tough this is. A lot of parents have no idea how much pressure that I'm under. Uh, so this also came up in our discussion, what parents think they know but really don't know about their children in school, and this is what they had to say. So when, when, when kids say, High school is a lot more difficult than people's suspicion. What specifically is it that makes high schools so hard? Is it interpersonal relationships? Is it just the, the study loads? Is it trying to be accepted? Is it trying to fit in? Is it trying to figure out who you're going to be and what you I mean, what is the pressure? You know, what are the primary pressures, would you guess, that make this such a difficult leap for so many kids? I think it starts with this expectation that our parents and their parents have. It's like, High school, the best years of your lives. Like, oh, high school's where you're having fun. Like, you do this, and they tell you all these stories. And then, in our minds, and especially when we're going through rigorous academic programs, like all of us are, it's it doesn't match up, and we feel like we're failing the expectation that it should be something that's definitive in our lives as something positive. But when all these little things go on around us, it can definitely have a detrimental effect, and feel like, oh, we're just not good enough. So they all feel. We are failing expectations everywhere. It's supposed to be the best time of my life, but I'm not really sure that it is, and this causes great angst. So there seems to be this other disconnect when parents think they might be encouraging their children that in fact they're doing just the opposite. Yeah, you're all saying, yep, that's what's happening. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, sometimes you hear that we set the bar, kids think we set the bar too high for them. And I would say, I don't know if it's about how high or how low, it's more about we need to let our kids teach us about the bar. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we um, stand in our own shoes and our own experience to interpret what their world must be like and to try to teach them how they should be feeling as they're navigating their high school world and their experience rather than letting them teach us and validating what the experience is like for them because it's very different from when we were growing up um, and it's, it's more complicated. Um, they're living in this sort of global community where they're always on a public stage. Um, we didn't have to deal with that because we didn't have cell phones and we didn't have the internet. And the way we interact and the way we, our sense of self is entirely different now than it was when we were younger. So it's, it's, it's like comparing apples to oranges to try to say life should be this way and you right. should feel this way and you should experience it this way. Yeah. It's two different worlds. Yeah, I was astonished at comparing that to my own high school experience when the earth was still cooling many years ago. <laughs> but it's such a big problem now, death by suicide, that there was actually a summit. Jefferson, Clear, uh, Clear Creek, and Gilpin counties all came together looking for solutions because so many people wanted solutions. And we, we have actually talked to 400 parents about this. Parents uh, 18 to 24, 24 to 35, 35 to 55. And they all have this, I believe, serious misconception that there's not enough help. Am I wrong about that? Do you think there's enough help? They all say, I'm not sure there's enough help 
uh, for my, my kids on the question of death by suicide? I think there's a lot of help. I think there's a lot of existing support. I think that it's important to continually publicize where that lives, where that's located, where people can go. Uh, it does exist. Uh, do we always have the best funding? No, we don't. That's something we would like to increase for sure. Uh, but that, that help does exist. It, it exists in the schools. It exists at Jefferson Center for Mental Health and other mental health providers throughout our community. Right. It, help, it, it exists in public health um, in a variety of of different places it already exists right. we just need to make sure people know where to go the when they piece. need health the mm -hmm. mental health yeah. piece yeah. Uh, I think no, no one uh, more than educators and professionals in Colorado have learned how important the mental health piece is mm -hmm. given all the other problems we've had here and other contributing things I wanted to ask you about so uh, the kids say uh, there are often crises in relationships because relationships are so important in high school uh, illness uh, a major loss in their family, uh, school and career, so career st stress, most of, you know, who am I, what am I going to be, what am I going to do, unstable housing, childhood trauma, and substance abuse, also big players in the death by suicide equation? You're just running down a, a list of risk factors mm -hmm. um, is, is what you're really highlighting there for suicide. So you can pick those, yes, yep. you guys, that you can right. pick these out and you can look at them and, and mm -hmm. is that how you get ahead of the problem? I think that one of the things that we really focus on in communities that care and public health and, um, and the schools are really doing this as well is looking at what the risk factors are, seeing how we can mitigate those and then at the same time making sure that we are bringing in protective factors in every possible way we can because the reality is that there's ups and downs in life and we want to try to make sure that those downs don't go down too far for our teenagers but we also have to, we have a responsibility as adults to really surround our youth with a sense of hopefulness and to, to let them know how much we care about them, how much we love them, and how awesome we think they are. And then to have these conversations, these ongoing conversations, like Michelle was saying, where we're really diving deeply into understanding who they are and what they want and what they believe and letting them know that we support them and we think they're amazing. And that really makes a huge difference and it's something that doesn't cost anything and that every single person that interacts with a teenager in Jefferson County truly can do. And that's where we're starting to go upstream. Right, uh, so very important. And I know out of the summit, uh, another big point was policy, mm -hmm. policy for mental health and coordination of care. Mm -hmm. So are, there, are, we, are we making strides there too? I mean, these parents all seem to agree that there needed to be better policy and more coordination of care. You agree. You're all shaking your head again. <laughs> I, there are so many ways in which uh, organizations in Jefferson County, statewide as well, are, are connecting around a variety of different issues, including mental health supports, including suicide prevention, connections to Jefferson County Public Health, connections to the schools, connections to st uh, state agencies and public health agencies. Um, we have we all have coalitions where uh, multiple agencies and organizations are involved in addressing specific issues. Those have been happening for many, many, many years. That's right. not new. Yeah, you guys are so important though because the numbers are, <laughs> according to the information out of the summit, uh, young people ages 18 to 24 and adults older than 45 <laughs> die by death by suicide at higher rates than the rest of the population <laughs> in Jefferson County. What 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 is it about, is it, is that, it can't be specific to Jefferson County. There, there, have, there has to be other places where those numbers are equally as high. But why? In fact, if you looked at a map of the U.S., you would see all down the Rocky Mountain region that the suicide rates uh, are, are incredibly high, and they're, they're certainly higher than the national average. In Colorado, 56% mm -hmm. higher yes. in some areas. Unfortunately, we, we continue to be on uh, in the top 10 list for uh, states with rates for uh, suicide. Um, so that's not a top 10 list that we want to be on, but that has been consistent, but that also kind of connects down the, the Rocky Mountain region. There's a lot of uh, talk about why that is. Um, you know, access to health, the perception of, you know, that, that it's, it's your own challenge, it's your own business, I don't want to connect to health. Right. Um, the, the high rates of firearm ownership, mm -hmm. um, so many different things contribute. It's no one single issue, right. but it's something that we all kind of share. So mm -hmm. much pushback on getting help, mm -hmm. uh, e even, in, even in, our, in our group of parents. 
it just seems to be this, it's my, it's my family's problem and I want to deal with it. Well, they want resources to deal with it. So um, I even have my 12 Talks chapstick now. I'm a huge <laughs> proponent of your program. What would you tell parents to be most vigilant? Let's conclude today by giving them this one piece of advice. What would you tell parents to be most vigilant for? So I want to start by saying I feel like suicide is the tip of an iceberg, really. There's so much underneath that we can also address and should address besides just being vigilant for suicide is to make sure that we're looking at the whole child because we also in Jefferson County have high rates of substance misuse and high rates of depression, high rates of um, assault, interpersonal violence between teens and relationships. And all of those factors really have the same risk factors mm -hmm. that you mentioned earlier. Sure and they have shared protective factors as well. So sometimes I think that when suicide is in the news, we really begin to focus on that. But when we can start to focus on the whole child, then we're starting to get underneath the problem and lift our children up. I'd say it's really important to connect, right? To connect to others, to have those social protective factors, to have loving people in your life in general, whoever that is, and to really be vigilant about uh, significant changes. You know, if you know your kiddo or how they, they act um, and who they connect with and what they do, and you are seeing changes in that in a significant way, and you're having these conversations as an ongoing uh, piece of your relationship, you can notice those changes. Mm -hmm. I think those two pieces, connectivity and the, and the changes are very important to uh, pay attention to. Yeah. And, and I would add to that, even just modeling that vulnerability, when parents are, are able to do that for their children, um, you know, oftentimes kids will think there's two emotions, good and bad, mm -hmm. two feelings. Right. But helping them to put language to express what they're feeling so they don't get so, they aren't weighed down so heavily by what they're feeling, which goes back to that ongoing conversation that we're having with our kids. Know, letting them know, too, that they are loved and that they are supported um, with human, like one, real life, one-on-one -on -one, relationships that are mutually um, nourishing, nurturing and mutually um, respectful rather than just having friends on their cell phones, right? right? Everything is, has to be so black and white when you're 16, 17, 18, and then as you, I think as you get older, you realize that you know there's a lot of gray uh, yeah, in between gray. there. Mm -hmm. You guys are, are phenomenal. You're on the front line of this, and so I'm such a fan of 12 Talks, I'll mention it again. <laughs> go, to the, go to the website, it's 12talks.com. Uh, Great information for parents. I want to thank Pamela Gould, uh, Heather Trish, the, the, uh, one of the few professionals I know with two first names as a first <laughs> name and a last name, Heather Trish and Michelle Gonzalez. Uh, you are uh, so helpful, and uh, let's hope that uh, maybe by this time next year we can reverse some of the numbers in Jefferson County. I so appreciate your time today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And thanks to everyone, and thanks to all of you for joining the conversation. Let's talk again soon.